Chapter 2 The Dragon Clue Instinctively, Nancy put both hands over her face and stepped backward into the doorway. Despite her quick move, she was showered with a spray of paper and sandy particles. What happened? Aunt Eloise asked excitedly. Are you hurt? I I guess not, Nancy answered, as brownish black smoke spread throughout the hallway. Bess and George dashed from the apartment to look around for the cause of the explosion. Nancy joined them and a few seconds later held up a small tube. I believe it was a giant firecracker somebody set off. A firecracker, Bess repeated. Thinking that mysteries for Nancy Drew had started in many unusual ways, but never before with a giant firecracker. Ever since the time Mr. Drew had asked his daughter to help him unravel the secret of the old clock, until recently, when Nancy had solved the mystery of the clue in the old stagecoach, she had been in many precarious situations. The giant firecracker might have injured the young detective badly. Nancy was staring at the Soong's door. Was the explosion some kind of warning to the Soong's? Or, by chance, had someone learned that Nancy was interested in the mystery and used this means to scare her off the case? By this time, all the doors along the hallway of the apartment house were being opened and curious, frightened faces looking out. When the tenants found that no damage had been done, and no one had been hurt. They closed their doors again. The last apartment to be opened was the Soong's. An elderly man with a long beard and wearing a black Chinese suit looked inquiringly at the girls. Miss Drew stepped up and said, Hello, Grandpa Soong. I want you to meet my niece, Nancy Drew, and her friends Bess Marvin and George Fane. Mr. Soong bowed low. It gives me deep pleasure to meet the relative and friends of my very fine neighbor. I was on my way to answer the buzzer when I heard a loud explosion. Can you good people tell me what happened? Mr. Soong, we think that a giant firecracker was set off, Nancy replied. Would you possibly know why? Grandpa Soong looked startled. I know nothing about it. You think perhaps that because most firecrackers are made in Chinese territory, I should know the reason? Oh no, Nancy replied quickly. Then she told about the figure she had seen running down the hall just before the explosion. Grandpa Soong smiled. Without a better description, I could not identify such a man or woman, but I am sure I would not know him anyway. The young sleuth went from door to door along the hallway, asking the various occupants if they had noticed the running figure. Each denied having seen anyone around. When Nancy returned to the group, Aunt Eloise invited Mr. Soong into her apartment so that the girls might become better acquainted with him. Under the strong light of a reading lamp, the elderly Chinese stared at George Fane. Suddenly, he said, Please forgive my rudeness, but you remind me very much of my Chiche. Of course, she is Chinese and you are American, but your hair, your flashing black eyes, even your dress reminds me so much of my granddaughter who is away visiting. George was startled, not only because Grandpa Soong did not suspect that anything unusual had happened to Chiche, but also that she herself looked so much like the missing girl. She glanced at her clothes and had to admit that her mandarin collared overblouse did indeed look oriental. Aunt Eloise and the others seated themselves and almost at once Grandpa Soong began to talk about his writing. My book has been many years in preparation, he said. I spent much time in the interior of China gathering very valuable archaeological data. I hope my work will be of great benefit to mankind. I'm sure it will be, said Aunt Eloise. Grandpa Soong, did Chi Che give up her after-school job at Stromberg's bookshop? Oh, no, the elderly man answered. 
She loves her work and her studies. They mean much to her. I presume she has asked for a leave of absence from the shop while she is away visiting. Nancy asked, Did Chi Che leave you a note, Mr. Soong? Yes. As he took one from the pocket of his jacket, he said, I would cherish the idea if you girls would call me Grandpa Soong. And they nodded. The note was written in Chinese characters, and Grandpa Soong began to translate it. Going on holiday with college friends. Homecoming indefinite. Nancy had listened intently, but now her attention was drawn to a hand-painted dragon in the lower right-hand corner of the stationery. Curious, she mentioned it. This stationery is not the kind used by my Chiche, Grandpa Soong explained. It must have been given to her by the friend she's with. He laid the note on the table, then went on. The dragon is a very old and sacred symbol of China. The ancient name of the dragon was Long, and children believed in Long just as Western children believe in Santa Claus. Legend tells us also that the dragon is the god of thunder. He appears in the sky as clouds which are said to be formed by his breath. Logically, then, the dragon is good because he produces rain and that, in turn, makes good rice crops, which are so necessary to the life of Chinese people. The elderly man's audience was fascinated. Presently, Nancy said, So often when I have seen pictures of dragons, they are accompanied by strings of pearls on the beasts or on the frames. Is there any significance to this? Probably, but the story is lost in antiquity, Grandpa Soong replied. The combining of pearls with dragons in decorative designs is an ancient custom, and while used principally in China, it was also used in the East Indies and Japan. Grandpa Soong smiled. I have heard that originally every self-respecting dragon had a pearl embedded under his chin. This gave him a special rank. Nancy was thinking that all this information was extremely interesting, but the subject was not furthering her endeavors to glean any clue as to why Chiche had left the note for Aunt Eloise, implying she was in danger. Finally, Nancy said, Grandpa Soong, have you a good photograph of Chiche? The man's eyes twinkled. From a pocket of his coat, he pulled a picture of a most attractive Chinese girl, dressed in a greenish-blue brocaded Chinese silk dress with an inch-high tight collar. Chiche does resemble you, George, Bess spoke up. Of course, her hair is arranged a little differently, but she certainly looks like you. Grandpa soon laid the picture on the table next to the note. Deep in thought, he paced up and down Aunt Eloise's living room, his hands behind his back and his gaze on the ceiling. Finally, he turned to the group. You will excuse me, I am sure, he said. A thought just came to me, which I must put in my manuscript. Without another word, he went to the door and out to the hall. Oh, he forgot Chiche's picture and the note, said Bess. She picked them up and started after him. Nancy took hold of Bess's arm. Wait, I'd like to keep the picture and note for a little while, she said. An idea just came to me. A brainstorm, George asked, chuckling. I guess you might call it that, Nancy replied, smiling. I think the dragon is a definite clue. But before I tell you any more of my plan, I have another suggestion. I feel sure Mr. Soong, as well as Chiche, may be in real danger. The person who lighted that giant firecracker rang Mr. Soong's buzzer. Perhaps he planned to have the baby bomb go off in the poor man's face. It might have blinded him. Anyway, I believe we should protect him, as well as try to find Chiche. I agree with you a hundred percent, Aunt Eloise declared. What do you suggest? Nancy said she thought they should obtain Mr. Soong's consent to keep the door between the two apartments unlocked. 
We can run in every once in a while and see if he's all right. Also, being alone, he may not eat properly. How about inviting him to share meals with us? I think that's a splendid idea, said Aunt Eloise. But before I ask him, what is this other scheme you have up your sleeve, Nancy? The young sleuth smiled. It's a very daring plan, I warn you. End of chapter 2